All right. <clears throat> Here are some often unrecognized factors in squatting that, dram that change dramatically or vary from person to person and can totally change how you have someone squat. So the first factor that often goes unrecognized, as simple as it is, is this line of force. Now we've got a piece of metal here, but in, and that would be the same thing as if you had a big weight up here on your shoulders and that center of mass must stay over your feet. So that's why right now you can see it's virtually balanced through the body, just like if you were at the top of a squat and it's somewhere mid-footish because you're not too far up towards the toes and too far towards the heels. Around that line is where everything occurs, everything. And the two main things I need you to see right away are the knee goes forward and the butt goes back. And as the knee goes forward, there's this thing called a moment arm that's created. The further forward this knee goes, the greater this amount of weight influences the knee and knee muscles. So 100 pounds times this 4 inches is twice the load on the knee as 100 pounds on your back times this 2 inches. That change right there doubled the load on your knee and your knee muscles. The same thing is true back here in this moment arm. Now it's pretty typical with hips and hip muscles being typically more tolerant of load than the knee that we typically have a greater moment arm um, distribution to the hip muscles and the knee muscles. This is not a bad way to squat right here where this moment arm is twice as long as this moment arm because you're putting an awful lot of that on these really strong glutes and hip, and hip joint and all that stuff. Here's the thing though with everybody being built, built differently not only can it change those proportions some, but it can change your ability to squat in general. Here's the first thing. There are two things that can manipulate how far forward your knee can go. And if I didn't say it before, the knee and hip have a forward backwards give and take relationship. You probably saw that when I brought this knee back to show you moment arm, the hip went back. If the knee goes forward, the hip doesn't have to go back as far. So take a look. If you have limited dorsiflexion, here you are. That's as far as your tibia can lean forward, then that's going to totally influence how far back your butt has to go. So right there, dorsiflexion. Keep in mind that your dorsiflexion could be limited by tight stuff. It could be limited by weak stuff, creating the tight stuff. It could be limited by structure inside of you without anything you can do about that, called like a bone spur in your ankle. So don't go around thinking you can stretch everything and fix everything. Second thing that affects how far forward your knee goes is this length that we could call tibia, but it would be more accurate to call it floor to knee. Because anything under your heel affects that height or the length of this segment. And as you notice, if I lift the heel, it travels forward. As it travels forward, the butt comes forward. So along with that heel of your shoe, how much rise is in your shoe, there are also structural variances amongst people. The segmental proportions, where someone could, in proportion to their femur, have a really short tibia, or in proportion to their femur, have a really long tibia, which will influence things very differently. So right now, let's take a look. If I put a very short tibia on this person, you're going to notice that their ability to squat down starts to look like he's leaning really far forward. If this person's tibia was longer, they're just collapsing more. They're not necessarily leaning forward more, and that's going to totally change how it feels on their low back. And they might be going, oh, squats are all in your low back. Yeah, especially when you're built this way. And someone who's built differently, it will feel entirely different. And they'll say, no, squats are always in the quads. Why don't you understand this? They don't get that the proportions are critical to this assumption and sensation. So what happens if you're one of these people, and I'm going to exaggerate it. I'm not saying there's anybody exactly like this. But what if your femur was ridiculously long compared to this segment right here? You are never going to be able to squat all the way down. You're never going to be able to fold all the way up, ever. In order to get any lower than this, you're probably going to feel like you're falling. Most people with proportions that lean this direction will often say, I can't go any lower. Yet if you check their knee flexion, they have more than that. If you check their hip flexion, they have more than this. But their proportions do not allow them to go any further, otherwise they will fall down. If their trunk is short, it makes it even worse. If someone's trunk was so short that they had to put the weight roughly right here, they are bent forward and all they feel is low back and all they feel is hip. If, by contrast, you had someone with proportionally shorter femur, proportionally longer floor to knee, and proportionally longer torso in terms of where they can put the weight, 
This person could fold up, sit all the way down, and they have no idea why anybody thinks squatting is difficult. This person feels quads more than anything else. Halfway down looks like this to them. This is not getting fatigued because it's not all perpendicular to the ground. Totally different thing. So look again at the extremes. Here is an optimum squatting proportion. And of course, if you don't have any dorsiflexion, it still messes with you. So all of these factors are interdependent. But if I were to have a short trunk or put the bar really low, and a proportionally long femur, and a proportionally short tibia, this person hates squats.